Welcome to the Money Talk Podcast. I am back again with another episode. Uh, today, we're going to do something different. I'm going to read to you guys what the pod ta- podcast topics are, and then I'm actually going to show you uh, how much money I made last week. I'm going to do this at the beginning of every podcast in order to give other viewers time to jump in live. So those of you who are here first will get to see how much money I made, how much money I spent to make that money. I'm going to show you the mileage. I'm going to show you all of that using my gig tracker. So before we get that, I'm going to let you know what the topics are. First up, we're going to watch a video of the Lyft CEO uh, going face to face with Jim Cramer. He's a stock guy, but I think drivers can get some valuable information from this conversation. We also get to see how many rides did Lyft have to give uh, that were late for the airport that Lyft had to pay out. So, you know, that during the holidays, they were they said, hey, if you're late for your 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 ride by more than ten dollars, ten dollars by more than ten minutes. We are going to give you up to a hundred dollars so you can do whatever you want with that. If even if that means taking an Uber, we're going to talk about why Uber stock is jumping and what we as drivers should do in response to that. It won't be tax advice, but I'm going to tell you what I would do if I were in a position to be investing. We're going to talk about the congestion tax that's happening for rideshare drivers and what I would do in that scenario. We're going to talk about the, how the court in a specific state upheld minimum wage for drivers. We're going to talk about Uber partners with taxi in London. We've been seeing some of that in America. So we do need to pay attention to this growing trend. It looks like it's going to be a thing in major cities and it's going to trickle down to smaller cities. So we do need to pay attention to this. We're going to talk about the new rideshare options threat that a driver group is threatening Uber and Lyft with saying, hey, if you can't increase driver pay um, and you're going to pull out of our market, here's what we're going to do in response to that. The Uber driver did a hit and run with the passenger in a car and the passenger details her experience. That's a good one. We're going to talk about the drunk Uber driver that destroyed a child's future career. It's pretty sad. It's pretty upsetting as well. We're going to talk about the rideshare driver uh, standoff. We're going to talk about the missing Texas woman with rideshare connections, how Lyft is coming to a new Canadian city that borders an American city. So it's going to create some more competition for drivers in those cities. They need to be aware of this. We're going to talk about the new program, how it will hurt rideshare drivers in specific cities, but it's starting to pop up like more often. So we're going to take a look at that as well. And we're going to talk about how to, how to handle high congestion areas. That's something that I suffer with that I'm still trying to find a solution for. Uh, I didn't realize other drivers in different cities were having this issue. And we're going to take a quick look into that. But before we get into that, I'm going to show you my earnings from this previous week. So this is what we call Samsung Dex. It is connected to my phone, which allows me to project the apps and things on my phone onto the, the screen. I want you guys to think, can I fake this or Photoshop it? Cause this looks weird. So I'll show you proof first. We'll go to Uber. We're going to my weekly summary. We'll go to last week. So with Uber, I only made $75. I technically only drove one day. It says Thursday, but I started at 4 AM Eastern standard time, which is the time the Uber day starts. So I I'm assuming that the ride that got caught for Thursday originated Thursday, like maybe at like 350, but I actually picked it up on Friday. So in total, I mean like 70, what was that total? Weekly, oops, weekly summary, 7543 with, with Uber, nothing to brag about, but I want to show you guys everything. This is my first time driving in a while. And then we go over here to Lyft, go down to our, that's the weekly breakdown. We want the weekly summary, see all activity, weekly breakdown. That's what we want. And then you can see I made $556 and 75 cents with Lyft. I drove 14 hours and 42 minutes. Book time was 12 hours and 34 minutes with 43 rides. You can see my tip 79.38. Pretty good. What is that? More than 10%. Shoot, almost 20%. That's that's not bad. A little less than 20% doing some mental math in my head. Uh, but what does that break down to? So I have my spreadsheet that I made and uh, it's 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 pretty good. It breaks down everything for me. I'm messing things up. No. All right, there we go. But uh, I, I haven't even really learned how to navigate this thing perf- in, like in perfection yet. So first we can uh, look at my miles. Uh, so I drove Friday, Saturday. So I do want to point out this, like you see how it says personal business, personal business. If you don't do this and you get audited by the IRS, they will invalidate your mileage. Like 
they want to make sure that so all right let's here's a scenario i leave my house right when i drive from my house to pick up a passenger the irs considers that as personal mileage i disagree but i'm not the one that makes the rules and i don't want to get in trouble so you know i have to abide by them this is one of the main reasons i made this spreadsheet so i always calculate from my house to my starting point or to the pickup location if, I, if i'm driving downtown i'll calculate from my house to downtown then i'll turn my app on and i'll do my mileage so you can see my personal here and then uh at the top it separates business miles from personal miles so i just put in whatever i see at my odometer and then you know i just check it off as i go so then over here right you can see where down here i put in my my daily earnings also my daily expenses over here Zoom in a little. You can see I spent two dollars on air. One of my air, my tires needed some air, and then I spent thirty-two dollars and twenty-seven cents on gas. Now I haven't refilled my tank since I drove, so there's still some more gas that should be added in here, but I'll have to wait till I obviously go buy that gas. But you can see that with the thirty-two dollars and twenty-seven cents, I I made total of six hundred and twenty-one dollars between Uber and Lyft. It pulls up the total from the bottom, and then it totals it up here so 17 hours 36 minutes in total 35 dollars and 28 cents total now i don't want you to think that i can make 35 dollars every single day in my market keep in mind i will work on the busiest days of the week so don't don't think i'm out here balling just because of that um if you live in a in, and i'm in the mid cap market i live in charleston so it's this is what it is a little slower than usual um, but even with that being said, I'm pretty happy with that. You can see my mileage. I drove 493 business miles. This is just business miles. So my per mile rate is calculated based off of business miles as well. And then you have my expenses. Um, this, this is the total. So, so far I spent $35 and 27 cents this month on expenses. And this is my per hour. So I made it so that it calculates how much I spend for every hour I'm working. So it's two dollars. We can subtract it from the thirty-five twenty-eight to get our net, which would be I'm averaging thirty-three dollars and fifty-eight and twenty-eight cents after expenses. But there's still more expenses to be added. I have to add my car payment, things like that, as they come in. So as they come in, it'll become more accurate at the end of the month. And then you can see my per mile. So for every mile I drive so far, my expenses are seven cents per mile. So then I would just subtract it from this, and then that would be my net per mile. So a uh, pretty good spreadsheet. At some point, I'm going to add taxes to it. And if you want it, it's in the pin linked. It's uh, through my Patreon. You can support me for one month for $5, get it, download it, and then stop supporting me. Or you can continue to support me. I will have other like spreadsheets like this coming out in the future. Eventually, I want to turn this into its own app. But um, that'll be further down the line. But any contributions will go towards making this better. It won't actually go towards any of my personal bills. When I become debt free, I want to be able to say I did it with 100% ride share and none of my YouTube money or Patreon money. So just so you know, whatever you invest into me is going to be coming back to you from, as a creator uh, subscriber relationship. So hope you guys enjoy that. And we are going to start diving into the podcast topics. All right. So here's the first one. It's, uh, it's a video. We'll uh, listen in, chime in and see what they got going on. In this new environment with interest rates finally sinking, what do you do with a stock like Lyft? Earlier this year, the ride-sharing company looked to be in bad shape. It was losing market share to Uber, struggling to pivot to profitability. Then in March, in March, they brought an experienced tech executive and CEO, David Risher, and he immediately started cutting costs, only laying off 26% of the workforce. You have to do what you have to do. So David Risher, I'm pretty sure, David Risher, uh, I'm pretty sure he's from Amazon. See where he came from. He came from Microsoft. I see. Let's see his work history. I never actually looked into it. All right. So David Risher. Oops. David Risher served as an executive at Microsoft Corporation and was a senior vice president at U.S. retail at Amazon from 1997 to 2002. In November 20, 2009, together with Collins, he founded World Reader. Okay, so yeah, he did come from Amazon. He kind of speaks like uh, an Amazon person if you've ever worked there. 
Earlier this month, Lyft reported a top and bottom line beat with robust guidance. Stock actually tumbled nearly 6% in response, supposedly because their gross bookings and ride growth metrics fell short of Uber's. Wait a second. The self was overdone. Stocks rallied 16% since then. So could this be the beginning of a larger rebound, which you know I think it is? Let's check in with David Richard, CEO of Lyft, who's in here in person. Mr. Richard, welcome back to Mid Money. It is so good to be here, Jeff. How All are right. you? <laughs> well, I want to tell you something. I, I'm a nervous traveler. Okay. So I've got you. I hate being late. Mm -hmm. I always think I'm going to miss the plane. Okay. I'm scared to death. I'm, on, I'm waiting for the uh, UB asterisk R yeah. to show up. Yeah. Give me some certainty that maybe. I don't know why he did that. I don't know why he's not just saying Uber. It's weird. It took me what, like a, a second to do the mental gymnastics he just put me through. Maybe I'm using the wrong guy. Well, you are using the wrong guy, and here is why I can tell you that. So we announced something called the Guaranteed Airport Pickup. And to your point, everyone is stressed during That's holidays. And the holidays should be so great. They're a time of getting together with your family. But man, what time am I getting to the airport? Is a car going to pick me up? So on and so on. So look, we say we guarantee we're going to pick you up. If we are more than 10 minutes late, we will pay you up to $100 in Lyft cash. That's enough for you to take one of those Ubers. It's a huge mistake for you to take, but there you go. No. Okay, so while I read the comments, he's going to tell us how many payouts he had to do as a result of that uh, promise. I want you guys to guess, but I'm going to read the comments in the meantime. So Ron says, I bought... 18 months uber stock 18 months ago and is doubled in that time that's pretty good pretty dope he asked how accurate does lyft uber count miles at your end of your taxes so not very accurately to be to be honest they only count your your driving miles and i don't even know how accurate that is but they only uh, calculate the miles from when a passenger is in your car and maybe from when you're on the way to a passenger but in real life you're driving a lot more than that if you're waiting for a ride and you're driving around looking for a ride, that is considered business miles. So using like the mileage that Lyft and Uber provide to you at the end of the year, it's not, you're leaving money on the table. You're leaving, um, cause you know, we get 65 cents per mile driven as a tax write off. You're leaving every mile that you're not tracking accurately. You can lose those. And that's even why I don't like using the accurate trackers the automatic trackers, because if you lose GPS, you lose internet and you're driving around and those apps can't talk to your phone to know where you're going, you're going to lose miles. That's why with my grid tracker, I made it so that it, you have to put in what's in your odometer because there's going to be nothing more accurate than what's, what's being shown on your car. Ron says, do they count your miles when you're online or just when you have requests? Not when you're online. So it's just when you have requests, but I'm not a hundred percent sure if it's including the pickup or not. Right. So I'm not 100 percent sure about that, but we can uh, we can look it up. Right. Let's use Bard. Um, hmm. I forgot how to ask this question. Does Uber and Lyft count your miles as long as the app is open? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what that says. I don't believe this. I'm gonna ask Google now. Just copy and paste it. The Uber app attempts to record all your online miles. Okay, so they do online miles. But even if even then, if you go offline and you're traveling to like a surge or something, that still that still counts as business miles from a legal standpoint, right? So Uber Uber does seem to track your miles as long as you're online. Let's let's look at this article just to make sure. Yes, the Uber app attempts to record all your online miles, the miles you drive while you have the app open. Uber's in-app tracking won't always tell the full story about the deductible miles. If you haven't been logging them yourself, you can use Uber and other tools to reconstruct your business miles at tax time, which I have done this back when I was like newer, uh, where I wasn't tracking my actual miles. So instead of like putting zero and not getting any of the standard tax uh, deduction, I would go put in what they say. But I knew that's when I first learned that, all right, there's a there's something missing between what they say and what actually was. These days, the Uber app attempts to track all the miles you drive 
while you have the app open, your online miles. If you rely on Uber for deductible miles, nope, I skipped something. These can include the miles you drove on the way to the pickup with a passenger or Uber Eats delivery in the car while waiting for your next trip. This hasn't always been the case. A few years ago, Uber only tracked the miles you drove while on a trip. So shout out to Uber. They're doing it well. Let's see what Lyft is doing. So this is from, uh, from their actual website. Miles gained while driving with Lyft won't count towards your personal mileage plan. Or this is, this is for rental. That's not even relevant. Let's see what this says. This is still rental based. Let's go here. This, I don't, I don't do Cora. Two thousand nine. That's all right. So I'm not finding a quick answer for the lift side of it. I will dig into it and bring it up again, but I'm gonna keep moving forward. Well, before I do, let's uh finish checking out those comments. Asif says, "Nah, don't listen to that man. He will make you lose money." So I'm not listening to him for tax advice. I just was curious about the interaction he would have with the CEO. So I will not be getting any tax advice from what he says. I, and I, 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 again, this is not tax advice for me, uh, but don't, don't follow this guy at all. Okay. So these kinds of things are no, we're no stranger with you. You have, you're an inventive person. Mm. Your background is about invention and creativity. Every one of the things, look, women and connect. We can yep. just look at these things. You are just, it's a cauldron up there. <laughs> and not one of those crazy ones that we saw from some other guy who has a car coming. <laughs> well, tell me how you come up with these ideas and tell me if you think they're working. Because I know you're also a very tough benchmarker of yourself. Yeah, yeah. So I do think they're working and I'll give you two uh, reasons for that. So number one, if you look at when I started, we were up 10% year on year in ride growth. Second quarter I was there, we were up 17%. I don't like this. I don't like this this perspective he's about to take um, because we 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 every both Uber and Lyft suffered a lot of ride losses because of the pandemic. You know, people working from home, people needed less rides, people weren't going out as much. And now that things are normalizing, people are naturally you know they're going to the office more often, they're going out more often. So him taking credit for this is a little there, there are some nuance in it, but it's a little deceiving. I, I don't like this take. Now we're up over 20%. That's accelerating growth in a market where that is not always the case, number one. Number two, we're able to bring out new innovations. You mentioned Women Plus Connect. So this is a way for women riders and drivers to choose to ride with each other. And it's a game changer. If you've seen some of the social media on it, people love it. And it's understandable why. It feels safe. It feels comfortable. It feels like I've got a comrade in, in the car. And then number three. All right, so we'll, we'll address Women Plus Connect. Uh, we, we spoke about this in the past. I think that... Logically, I, I get why it exists. Um, I see this as a very great marketing tactic for Lyft in order to increase their, I think like 10 or 15, 10 to 15% of the entire driver base is women. Like that's not a lot. So in order to get more drivers, having something where women can get matched with just women is a benefit for Lyft, right? It, it, it encourages more women to take rides and it encourages more women to give rides, right? I think women are like 50, it's like 50, 50 split for passengers when it comes to men and women, but there's like 10 to 15% women drivers compared to men drivers. So I understand why they, they took this approach, but legally speaking, how is this legal? Like, how is this not discrimination? And like, I, I just don't understand, but I will say, I understand why it exists. We do have some articles uh, that will come up that, you know, will be a reminder to why sometimes Men suck when it comes to women, like period. It, it, that's just the way it is. But we'll get to those later. Let's talk about airports one more time. We've given about two and a half million rides just in the last couple of weeks, just to airports, two and a half million rides. Guess how many, and I'll ask you the question, out of those two and a half million rides, guess how many we were so late that we actually had to pay for your, your Uber? How many, pick a number. All right, I'll say, I'll say 10%. 10%, so that'd be 250,000 rides. The actual number, 72 rides. 
72, 72, per, two 72 rides. actual, no, not 72 rides. 72, 72 rides. rides. Yeah, yeah, point oh one percent. So this is a rides. decent a bet a by you. Yeah, and I, I find this really hard to believe. But if the, if it's true, if it's true, that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool that they only failed 76 times. So the bet, not the bet, but the promise was we'll get you to the airport on time. And if a driver is 10 minutes late, then we will give you up to one hundred dollars. Like that was the, the, the we, we spoke about it on the podcast last week, week before, and I, I thought it would be a lot higher than this. So if, if this is actually true, that's that's pretty good on Lyft. This is going to be great marketing for them. But I would want to see the numbers. I want to see like how they validated it. Like they can't just come up here and talk about something and just not have proof to back it up. So I will be digging and looking for that proof in the future. It's a decent bet. So the question of or the answer to how do we come up with our ideas? We obsess over our riders, we obsess over our drivers, and we over deliver. Well, I think this is really an important point to point out that the way people have been incorrectly valuing your stock is I don't mean to pick on anyone, but Jeffries has the, the standard. Uh, recap. Right, we're, not gonna, uh, so we're not gonna sit and uh have them talk about stocks. It's not what we came for. So we're going to move on to the next st story. So this one is stock related. I try to keep all of the uh, topics, you know, grouped. So Uber ears, Uber ears, Uber shares pop on inclusion in S and P 500. So if you don't know what the S and P 500, the S and P 500 is the top 500 stocks in America, right? So you have, you have people out there who, what they do is they have managed funds, right? They will go out and they'll buy stocks from each of the 500 companies in America. And then we as individuals, this is not tax advice, can go and invest in them, right? So the S&P 500 to me is, is where I would put majority of my money because it's safe. If the only way you lose a bunch of money is if the top 500 companies in America lose a bunch of money. And if the top 500 companies in America are losing a bunch of money, our problems are probably bigger than money. We're in some kind of major war or something is happening. We'll, we'll touch a little more on that, but let's go through the story. So Uber shares rose 5% in extended trading on Friday after the ride hailing company was added to the S&P 500 index, replacing sealed air corp. So whatever company this is, it is no longer considered in the top 500 companies. And I guess Uber is just entering at the bottom. The change will take place prior to the open of trading on Monday, December 18th, according to a press release. Today's December 4th. So people like Ron, who jumped onto this bandwagon long before the news even came, they're the ones who are going to benefit from this. If you're trying to buy it now, like you might increase money, but like just understand stock prices, the, the price uh, fluctuations have news built into them. So even though it hasn't technically happened yet, just based off of this news, people have bought the stock and that's going to reflect it in the stock price. A company's stock price often rises on news. See, I just literally what I just said. <laughs> a company's stock price often rises on news that is joining the S&P 500 because fund managers who track the benchmark, which gets updated each quarter, have to acquire the shares. They have to go out and buy the shares. Companies also have to meet certain valuation and profitability requirements. Uber shares debuted on the New York Stock Exchange in 2019, but the company was burning cash as it had to pay drivers enough to stay competitive in a low margin business. Its preferred metric was adjusted earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization, or EBITDA. So this is a very clear cut picture of why some of us might feel we're getting paid less because Uber was like, like people who were invested in Ubers, like big companies, were giving them money. And they were taking that money f as incentives to get drivers on the platform. And now that they're actually trying to stabilize and actually like run their business from a profitable perspective, they're not doing that anymore because they don't have that money. So the foundation of the business was created with money that the business itself wasn't generating. So now that like the responsibilities for Uber to generate the profits themselves rather than rely on investments, this is why we're seeing a decrease in pay over time. Most of Uber's adjusted EBITDA comes from mobility, but the company made its delivery business profitable faster than planned after recession fearing investors became more averse to investing money, losing companies. Growing advertising revenue has also contributed to Uber's profitability. And this is really important. Uh, some, some business plan to run on other people's money until they can't. Like Amazon wasn't profitable for like, what was it like 10 years? I think it was, but it's, it's, it's on purpose. They're saying, okay, we're getting money right? Let's invest it. Let's spend it so that we can grow faster. But as soon as Uber was worried that 
you know, their, their investors will pull back because of the recession or just because of how the times are right now, they said, all right, let's actually try to make money. And all of the changes we've seen over the last year or two is the response to that. Uber eliminated more than 3,500 jobs in 2020 and executives have since worked to improve its cost structure. For example, they reduced the cost of deliveries. Uber reported a net income of 221 million on 9.29 billion in revenue in the third quarter. That's not, that's, that's not that great. That's, that's, that's actually pretty bad. And in the past four quarters altogether, it generated over 1 billion in profit. This is great. So yeah, yeah. So this is why what four times that. So that, that's, that's an improvement. Nelson's. Okay. Nelson and my goal is to build a company that can compound top line rates at very, very attractive rates and continue to improve margins over a period of time. Uber CEO Dara told USB UBS and analyst Lloyd Walmsley at an investor meeting in 2021. This is old stuff. Here we go. According to S&P rules, members of the index must have positive earnings in the most recent quarter or and over prior four quarters in total. Constituents of the index must have an adjusted market cap of at least 14.5 billion. Uber has a market cap of 118 billion, while the median market cap of the com companies in the S&P 500 is just over 31 billion. So market cap is how many shares exist times the price of the share. So and that number comes out to 118 billion. All right, so that's just some uh, stock news. You guys really should be learning how stocks work. Um, just because as a solo contractor, you actually have the ability to get a 401k and I'm going to make a video about that. Talk a little more about it, but we really should be investing long-term. Uh, so I, I wouldn't go out and buy Uber shares. I know Ron says he has some, I would, I'd buy S and P 500 shares, but learn about it. You know, don't invest in anything you don't understand. And it is up to you to go and learn about it. I'll do my best to teach you guys. Uh, but, Personally, I'm not doing any investing until I, I'm debt free. And then once I'm debt free, I'm going to be making some more videos about how I will be investing in order to encourage other people to do the same. So before we go on to the next topic, we are going to go to the comments. So Ron says, woman connect will lose money. Average rider won't care. Then the closer the driver, the better. Maybe um, I don't think it's about it, it could be a loss leader for them. It could be something that they do in order to obtain a specific goal, right? They could be doing it just to increase how many drivers on their platform, uh, therefore lowering the surges in the area, which will in turn make them pay out less money to drivers, right? So it's just like Walmart. Walmart loses a lot of money on most of their products just to sell you bananas. Bananas are the number one income driver. I used to work there and they'll take a loss on other products just so that you can, they can take a profit on the more profitable products. So this, this could be something very similar. You could be ex ex like right in your, in your thought process there. All right. So the next story, the New York city congestion pricing, how much drivers will have to pay exemptions, surcharges and more. So we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks on the podcast and we finally have a breakdown of what people are going to, what people are going to have to pay, what businesses are going to have to pay and what rights your drivers are going to have to pay. And it's much, much worse than I thought. Latest cost of living increase for people living and working in the city. Yeah, we're talking about this hot button issue, congestion pricing. Today, a board recommended a $15 toll for cars that enter Manhattan at 60th Street and south of that street. Now, there are some exceptions. News for us, Melissa Colorado is live with details for us. And guys, after months of speculation, how much is the toll going to be? Who won't have to pay the toll? We're finally getting a clear picture of this congestion pricing plan. And we're also learning that groups who thought they would be exempt, we're talking about people who live in the zone, people who are going to medical appointments in the area, and public sector employees, we're learning they too will have to pay the toll. I just want to say that's pretty, that's pretty crappy. If you live in the area and you have to pay this, so... Also keep in mind, this doesn't stop the other tolls that it takes to get to New York City. I know most of you probably don't live there, but when I drove from South Carolina to Manhattan, it cost me almost a hundred dollars in toll just to get to the city, right? And it, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's like, there's several bridges that you have to take. You're going to be paying a toll, going to cross one bridge, one bridge into Manhattan, pay a toll, take another bridge to get to the Bronx, pay a toll. And it's like 
a mile from each other. This is a lot of tolls. So it really, really sucks that people who live here will still have to deal with this. So that means if you leave and you come back into your where you live, you're gonna have to pay like a congestion tax. That's pretty insane. You know, we'll hit New York. From this Upper West Side dad. It will affect everybody. To this hotel doorman. I don't think it's fair for the regular uh, people that work in the city. New Yorkers are facing the reality that the country's first congestion pricing program is finally taking shape. So this is the first one in the country, but it's the third one in the world. Hong Kong, I believe, has one, and I don't know where the other one is. By next spring, the average driver may have to pay a $15 toll for driving on or below 60th Street. We really made an effort to keep the base toll as low as we possibly could. The board in charge of coming up with New York's congestion pricing plan revealed the toll pricing structure meant to discourage drivers, improve air quality, and collect $1 billion each year for the MTA. Customers hailing taxis or hopping into a ride share will have to cover the toll charge. Okay. Oh man, I wish it wouldn't pause right over it. Uh, I do believe it's in the article, so we can kind of like hovering on it. There we go. So this is the breakdown for passenger vehicles, $15, small trucks, $24, large trucks, $36, motorcycles, right? I hear it is. This is what we really want to focus in on. So now we can see the taxis, they get to pay $1.25. I don't know why they, the taxis get to pay a cheaper like rate than the rideshare apps, but whatever, it is what it is. Rideshare apps pay $2.50 per ride. Now, initially, if I had to pay what the car is paid as a rideshare driver, $15 per hour, I would rather pay the $15, not per hour, but I would rather pay the $15 per day, right? You pay it once and then that's it. They're not going to double charge you even if you leave and come back. But as a rideshare driver, this is now different. If I take 10 rides, right? That's $25 just for 10 rides. If, if I'm going in and out of New York City 10 times, which if, if I'm working a 12 plus hour shift, that's easy. I can, I can do that in four hours. I can average 10, 10 rides in four hours. That's going to add up, right? And I, I assume that it would, it would have been the $15, but this new update with information that they're giving us, it's $2.50. Now, that is a, a cause for concern. So I wonder if they're going to stick with this. Uh, but let's, let's finish up with that video. That's $1.25 for taxi customers, $2.50 for app-based rides. Box trucks will have to pay $24. Larger trucks must fork over 36 bucks. Even stepping outside of rideshare, if, if, if a business, right, let's say they have to, let's say there's one business and they have to deliver a bunch of food to all the McDonald's in that area. Let's say there's like, I don't know, 20 McDonald's. They have to pay for large trucks 20 times, right? It might be different trucks. It might be the same trucks, but for the, for the ease of the example, that, that can be a lot of money. Now you might be thinking, oh, they're big corporations that can afford it. Not all of these corporations can, you're going to have a lot of the mom and pop places who, who do you know, food delivery uh, for people like truck deliveries that won't be able to afford this. And uh, it's like, we're, it's like, it's only equal out to be hundreds of thousands of dollars that is suddenly added to your, your business balance book. And if, if you're if you are already struggling, this could kill some businesses. Absent this, we're going to be choking in our own traffic. It's going to affect my pocket, honestly. It's going to be pretty tough. The MTA says money from the tolls will go into improving the city's subway and bus networks. But doorman Horacio Colon is unsure if that investment will make the subways safer. I don't feel comfortable taking the train, so I prefer to drive. New Jersey trains are awesome in New York City. I mean, weird stuff can happen, but that's the best public transportation I've ever had in my life and anywhere I've ever been. Drivers bracing themselves for a more costly commute on top of the tolls they already pay to cross the Hudson. Governor about. Phil Murphy is outraged. It's ripping off New Jersey commuters to pay for whatever financial failings the MTA has. We're considering all of our options, including further legal action. The board is recommending a $5 discount for drivers who use any of the four tunnels to get into the city, but no credit for drivers who cross the George Washington Bridge. It's a little That's the expensive um, outrageous, like to say the least, especially for somebody that commutes like myself two to three times a week. I mean, I, I, with the cost of living going up, the, the wages staying, you know. Now, I will say for people who 
don't live in the area, but they commute to work there. I do think uh, the public transportation is better. It's not as convenient, but um, I think they'll be okay. So I, I do think this will be a bigger harm to businesses and rideshare drivers. All right, so we'll move forward with that. So New York City's, this is some good news. New York City's minimum wage for delivery drivers is upheld by appeals court. So if you're not familiar with the backstory, uh, New York City drivers, union, taxi people, uh, the TLC people, they sued Uber and Lyft. And from that lawsuit, they are required to do a bunch of things like give them paid time off, uh, fair, the whole thing where if you get uh, deactivated, then there has to be like a, a good process for getting reactivated. That comes from this lawsuit. Um, but there's a new minimum wage that's been, uh, set and they appealed. And so this is the response to that appeal. A New York state appeals court has turned away a challenge by Uber technologies, Inc. And other companies to New York city's novel minimum wage law for app based delivery workers, allowing it to take effect. The Manhattan based Appellate division appeal appeal. I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce that. First department on Thursday denied appeals by Uber, DoorDash, Inc. and Grubhub, Inc. after a state judge rejected their claims that the law unfairly targets food delivery services. So I, I think the assumption here was that the hourly pay was justifiable for rideshare drivers, but I don't think the food services can afford it. And I agree with that. I don't, the, I don't, the food services don't make as much money as the people services. The court in September had temporarily blocked the law while it considered the appeals. The law will require companies to pay delivery workers 17 dollars and 96 cents an hour might as well just call it 18 which were raised to nearly 20 dollars in april 2025 companies can decide whether to pay workers hourly or per delivery which will be based on the hour workers log into the app uber doordash grubhub inc and a smaller food delivery surface relay claimed the law will force them to shrink service areas so deliveries do not take as long ultimately hitting customers and restaurants and drivers maybe maybe like it, it might make it more competitive for drivers. Some drivers might uh, win out from this, but it's, it's you never how you never know how things are going to go when there's like big changes all at once. In September, state judge Nicholas had allowed the law to take effect, but blocked the city from enforcing it against Relay pending the outcome of the case. The judge said that unlike other companies, Relay cannot immediately raise the fees it charges to restaurants and needs time to renegotiate its contracts. That's fair. The appeals court on Thursday denied the company's appeal without explanation. That's unfortunate, but so it goes. DoorDash, is, DoorDash in a statement said the court had chosen to ignore the harmful consequences such a misguided minimum pay rule will cause and failed to justify its decision to allow the city to pick winners and losers in how it's applied. I think it should be applied holistically. I don't, I don't really, I, I might not agree fully with the, the ruling itself, but I don't see why they should pick and choose how it's how it's like executed. I'm not a fan of that. Spokesman for Uber and Grubhub in separate statements said the companies were disappointed with the decision. Uh, uh, okay. New York city mayor, Eric Adams, a Democrat said the decision was a major victory for delivery workers. And it is, it is. So New York, I mean, they do have their issues with, with rideshare, but I do think they are the best place to be a rideshare driver. The minimum pay rate will guarantee our delivery workers and their families can earn a living and keep our city's legendary restaurant industry growing strong subjective this last part i don't think that will happen supporters of the city's law which is the first of its kind in the united states say it is needed because delivery workers in the city earn about 11 dollars an hour on average after expenses far below the city's 15 dollars minimum wage i believe that i believe food delivery like your money is really going to come from tips uh and and even in my experience when i'm when I did food, I earned about half the money I earn now. So if I'm earning like $30 on average with Uber and Lyft, I was earning like 15, 17, $18 an hour doing food delivery. And it just, it, once, once I tried Uber and Lyft, there was no going back for me. App-based delivery workers are usually treated as independent contractors rather than company employees. So general minimum wage laws do not apply to them. This, that, this is true. Uber and the other companies filed separate lawsuits in July, which were con consolidated. They say city officials based on the minimum wage law, based on flawed studies and statistics. Well, it, then it's up to them to create better studies and statistics, which would obviously be more in favor of themselves. The companies allege that the city surveys of delivery workers were based 
were biased and designed to elicit responses that would justify a minimum wage. Like that, that happens. That's real. But Mahone in September said the companies overstated the importance of those surveys to the city's legislative process. The judge also rejected several other claims, including the law, including that the law was invalid because it covers workers who deliver food from restaurants, but not from grocery and convenience stores. Ah, I see what the issue is now. Okay. The case are Uber Technologies versus New York City Department of Consumer and Worker Protection and DoorDash Inc. versus New York City Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, New York State Supreme Court, Appellate Division, Appellate Division. I got to figure out how that's pronounced. Okay. All right. So that's just an ongoing update into the new New York City minimum wage for delivery drivers. All right. So moving forward. Uber announces partnership with London's black cab drivers. I know most of my viewers are in America, but what they do outside of America, like it's, it needs to be paid attention to because this has been happening here. Right. And apparently the, the black cabs in London are like iconic. So if, if, if such a huge organization can bend to the will of Uber, it's something that we should be expecting to happen here as well, which it has been happening. It happened in San Francisco. I believe it might be happening in New York City. So let's let's get into it. Uber has decided to team up with London's black cab drivers in a bit to end bitter robbery for gaining control of the streets of London. The partnership will allow taxi drivers to find fares through Uber's app. Passengers will now be eligible to hail black cabs through app after a gap of six years. What does that mean? Does that mean they, they were on the platform before? The service is expected to start early next year per management. The first few drivers for the service have already been signed up. The inking of the deal signals a welcome turnaround as far as Uber's relationship with drivers of London's iconic taxis is concerned, alleging that Uber's app-based ordering and demand sensitive pricing threatened the livelihood of black cab, black cab drivers of the British capital. They had unsuccessfully challenged its London operating license in 2019. The drivers had also blocked the streets of London, expressing concern over the threat posed by the company. Interesting. Now, management appears eagerly to bury the hatchet in line with the objective. The agreement will see black cab drivers being offered jobs without a predetermined price range to the company. The cabbies can accept or reject the offer. Moreover, black cab drivers will not be charged any commission for the first six months of the deal. That's rough. That's rough towards actual drivers. Like, ooh, that's rough. That's that's a huge though. They that they probably had to do this in order to get the, the deal the deal done. Per Andrew Bream, the leader of Uber's UK's business, this is this deal represented a win-win-win situation as it would increase the efficiency of London's transport network, along with boosting options for taxi drivers. It's a win-win-win loss for for like non-taxi variety drivers. Win for Uber, win for taxi drivers, win for, for passengers, loss for like actual Uber and Lyft drivers that don't drive taxi. In fact, management has recently inked deals with taxi companies in many countries, including France, Belgium, Italy, and the United States. See, it's growing. This is something we need to pay attention to as it aims to end the strife with local taxi groups. Bream was quoted as saying, we're partnering with taxi drivers across the world, and the message here we are hearing from the, them is clear. Uber and taxis are better together. Uber currently, currently Uber carries a Zach's rank number three. I don't even know what that is. Oh, this is for stock, so we're not going to get into that. So yeah, uh, this is pretty, some interesting stuff. Um, it's not like that where I live and, and it makes me wonder is being a taxi driver in a city more profitable if you're able to do taxi and Uber, like, would you guys consider doing that? I don't know. I don't know if I would or wouldn't, I'd have to see some more numbers about it. So next story is that we have. A right tier driver say alternate companies could step in if Uber, Lyft leave due to proposed Minneapolis ordinance. So just some background on this. Uh, in Minneapolis, there is a driver's union who you know, they're pushing for like a change of pay, uh, an increase. And I, I believe it went through or it was shot down, but it's like it's on the cusp of like actually happening. And Uber and Lyft, we'll, we'll get into it, right? We'll, we'll see what they say in the story. Let's zoom in a little more here. Uber and Lyft drivers supporting a mini apps ordinance that would increase their pay say that they are prepared to ditch the apps should the rideshare companies decide to leave the city. In a press conference Tuesday, 
Ali, president of the Minnesota Uber Lyft Drivers Association, said his group has been talking to two other transportation network companies or rideshare companies about entering the Twin Cities market in the event that Uber and Lyft leave. This is weird to me. So if they could enter the market, I don't understand why they wouldn't have already done so. Maybe it's because they're afraid of Uber and Lyft. I don't know. That's weird. Over 1,000 drivers who are ready, Ed said, the, the same day that they, Uber and Lyft, pull out, we have people who will cover that so we don't have any problem. This is a big boast. Uh, I'm skeptical of it because if it were already so, then this, this whole conversation that they're having wouldn't have had to be had. They would have just switched already. He also said that the other companies, which he declined to name, would be willing to make drivers stakeholders in the business. Uber and Lyft threatened on August 15th to pull or limit their services in Minneapolis if the city council approved a then-pending ordinance to increase pay and workplace protections for their drivers. In an email to app users, Uber said it could be forced out of Minneapolis and asked users to email the mayor and council asking them to oppose the ordinance. Lyft said it would cease operation on January 1st, 2024. That's right around the corner. It's in a couple of weeks. If the bill were to be passed, we would unfortunately have no choice but to greatly reduce service and possibly shut down operations entirely, said Uber's email. The council eventually passed that ordinance on August 17th. Afterwards, Uber said it would only offer premium services in Minneapolis once the ordinance went into effect, but the ordinance was vetoed by Mayor Jacob Frey before further action from the ride share app. So he's probably not well liked by this uh, group. Tuesday's press conference also included council members Robin and Jason, who are advocating for a new ordinance that would only that would increase pay for rideshare drivers. Council member Jamal is also part of the effort. Wansley has led the efforts to pass a policy that would increase driver wages in the city after a bill in the state legislature was vetoed by Governor Tim Waltz in May, and after Frey vetoed the city council's first rideshare ordinance in August. After Tuesday's press conference, the business inspector inspections, housing, zoning, and committee. Okay, try that again. After Tuesday's press conference, the business inspections, housing, and zoning committee met and approved a motion to conduct a comparative analysis of three pay proposals for drivers. And I think this is fair, right? As much as I am for drivers getting paid more money, um, there needs to be data to back it, to justify it. And so I, I think that if they are um, pushing it down the road with the intention of doing like actual study before they make a decision i think as a governor that's 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 what you should do right as as much as it's counter to the whole ride share thing like i i understand this this analysis will be presented to the city council at a january 19th meeting so obviously there won't be any change between now and then wazi chavez and osman introduced the following three payment options for analysis model a this is the original proposal, a minimum compensation rate of $1.40 per mile and 51 cents per minute for the time transporting a customer. That's that's high. I think that's higher than New York's. All right. I could be wrong. Let's see. NYC ride share per mile. Ooh, no, their cost is uh, $1.75 and uh, per minute, 75 cents. So, okay. I lose my track. Here we go. So that would be that would be good. Uh, model B, uh, the mayor phrase proposal, a minimum compensation rate of $1.17, a little lower than the one before, per mile and 34 cents per minute for the transportation for transport for transporting a customer. Model C, a flat rate of $24 per hour applied only during the time it takes to pick up a customer or during the time transporting a customer. This is lower than uh New York City's proposal. I don't see Model C happening. Uh, that would probably be the best outcome. I think uh, Model B, if I had to like vote and pick one from these three options, assuming they don't get changed, I think Model B is probably what will happen. But Model A would be nice too. But Model C would be like the best for the drivers. But I don't see that happening. I don't, I don't see that happening. Wavez, Wandley and Chavez said the goal is to get drivers a wage of $15 per hour. But so then why would you, I, I guess the assumption is for the time they spent not uh, with a customer or picking one up, this would compensate that to $15 an hour. That doesn't make any sense to me. There's no reason 
any worker in our city or any business, small or large scale corporation should be paying anything less to their workers who make our city thrive and help it function day by day. That's a good statement. Minneapolis has a $15.19 per hour minimum wage for businesses with more than 100 employees. Uber and Lyft drivers are considered contract workers and therefore don't have a minimum wage. The city's council initially initial right your ordinance passed in August would have guaranteed drivers a minimum compensation of 51 cents per mile and $1.40 per mile. While they were transporting customers within city boundaries, the compensation would have increased annually proportional to the city's wage. Okay, so we, we've got the gist of it. Is this is going to be an ongoing thing where we're going to get opinion pieces, we're going to get uh, changes in thought processes, like different proposals. So as long as you're here with the podcast, I will be following this. Moving on to the next, Lyft launches ride service in Windsor. So this is Canada. I do have like a very small Canadian uh, viewership. I don't want to leave them out, but this also affects Americans. Uh, I'll show you why. Their website is terrible. Lyft is not rolling in Windsor. The US-based ride hailing company launched services in the city on Tuesday. Whether you're running errands or meeting up with friends, Lyft has got you covered. The company said in media release, Lyft is an app. We know what Lyft is. Also, Uber has been in Windsor since 2015. Okay. So they're going to give them some competition. Unlike the traditional taxi model, both companies use a dynamic pricing model, which bases the fare on local supply and demand at the time of booking. Lyft first expanded into Canada in 2017 with services in the Toronto area. Since then, the company said in a media release, it has provided more than 68 million rides to 2.5 million different Canadians. I didn't know. I didn't know that. They, that's not that long ago. Is that five years? Is my math right there? 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, six years. Lyft is offering new riders get 25% off their first three rides in the first 14 days with the code, that code. So if you're out there reading this and you're, you're a passenger, you, this is what you got to use. And if, if you're not a passenger, right, if you're a driver and you live near here, I would, this is where I would be. I, I don't know if it'll be busy. I don't know if it'll be slow, uh, but you want to be on the cusp of when there are a lot of passenger, a lot of passengers who need Lyft and not a lot of drivers in that area. It's going to cause crazy surges if that ends up being the case. Um, that's, I'm going to show you a map of where Windsor is. Windsor, Canada. map okay so here it is here's windsor All right and it's right by detroit <laughs> it's like right across the bridge i don't know how it works from a like a work perspective but now lyft drivers in windsor can i don't know if they'll be able to pick people up in detroit i don't know how it'll work um, but you know, that's going to have an effect on, on the Americans in that area. Maybe, right. Maybe Americans can come over here, pick up some Canadians and vice versa. But, um, I don't know. That's something to look into. Let's, uh, look into it. I'm, I'm actually really curious now. Can Uber drivers from Detroit go to Windsor? Yes, Uber drivers from Detroit can go to Windsor, Canada. However, there are a few things to keep in mind. Uber drivers must have a valid passport and be eligible to enter Canada. They will also need to have a Nexus card or other pre-clearance program enrollment to expedite their crossing at the border. Uber drivers may charge a surcharge for international trips. This is because they have to pay additional fees across the border. Uber rides from Detroit to Windsor may take longer than usual due to border wait times. This is especially true during peak hours. Yeah, I wouldn't go there during peak hours. If you're planning to take an Uber from Detroit to Windsor, it is best to book your ride in advance and allow extra time. So this is dope. Uh, usually it's it, depending on what state you're in, you can't even drop, pick up people in the other state. So it's cool that they have that going on and it's cool that we verified it. So let's move forward to the next article. All right. So this one uh, is an interesting one. The title is you put my life in danger. A woman jumps out of vehicle after Uber driver crashes on I-79. Why did he crash? Hmm. A woman sharing a frightening ordeal after she said an Uber driver hit a car and fled the scene all with her in the back seat. The young woman, Kiara, says she begged her Uber driver to stop after hitting the other vehicle. But when he didn't, she feared for her own life. And that's when she jumped 
out along a busy stretch of highway into traffic. I probably would have stayed in the car. <laughs> I probably would not have jumped out. The woman shared photos with Channel 11 News showing the vehicle's damage, a missing tire, mangled back door, and damaged bumper. Maybe I would jump out. I don't know. He put my life in danger and someone else's life in danger, she explained. Is there a video for it? That's not it. Now playing above. All right, we'll watch it. We'll watch it in a second. Kira said she ordered the Uber from Washington, Pennsylvania to Pittsburgh, a roughly 40 minute drive. She explained things were going smoothly until just before 1 a.m. when the driver missed her exit along Interstate 79. He put it in reverse on the interstate. What? That's wild. Just to get back to the exit, state police confirmed that's when the Uber driver identified as Cristiano and rammed into another vehicle, causing it to roll over. But instead of stopping, he kept going with Kira still in the back seat, begging him to pull over. I kept saying, please stop. Just please stop the car. I want to get out. I asked several times and at the point I had to just jump out. <laughs> it's not funny, Tristan. After she jumped out of the Uber, after she jumped out the Uber, the dr after she jumped out, the Uber driver finally stopped and Kira grabbed her cell phone and called for help. Why would he stop just because she jumped out? That's weird. Like you might as well keep going at that point. Unfortunately, she endured several serious friction burns and had to be taken to the hospital. Now she wants accountability from not only the driver, but from the company. It's hard to contact for help on the Uber app. I feel like there should be some type of an emergency button, she explained. No charges have been filed, but Uber confirmed that they are working with the police to help with the investigation. How are no charges filed? That's wild. That's wild. A place to do their banking and great restaurants. They caught us on an ad. So we're just going to move forward. Let's see. Seems to add, seems to be almost over, maybe. All right, we're just going to move on. So pretty interesting. Um, I definitely, I guess jumping out, yeah, because you never know like how, like what they're really going to do. I, I guess I'd rather jump out. So Las Vegas teen, James, a basketball stardom, dashed by drunk Uber driver. This one actually makes me a little upset. Um, it, it's actually, it, it, it bothers me. Watch News 3's ask. So while that ad is going, Ty Henderson's parents, Todd and Arisha Henderson, said he was catching an Uber ride home from basketball practice. Todd says police told the family the Uber driver was under the influence during the ride. He, his, this is from the, the kid, I, I think. Someone, one of the family members. He let it be known. Wow, the ad is not going to go if I navigate away. All right, so we're just going to wait. We don't have any comments to read, so we're just going to wait. <laughs> Here we go. Elf. A teenage boy is home recovering from the ICU after a car crash in an Uber. History's Kalia Patterson here in studio to tell us what led up to the crash. And Kalia, his parents tell you they are outraged. They are. Ty Henderson's parents say their 14 year old son is loved by many and a responsible kid. That's why they trusted him taking an Uber. Now they say he and the family are traumatized from that crash that happened just two blocks away from their home and no one contacted them except the hospital. What was supposed to be the start of a happy holiday season. It's Christmas time, fam. Like his Christmas finish be sitting in neck braces and come on, fam. Turned into a world of worry for Todd and Arisha Henderson Friday morning. From the time of his basketball practice being let out until six o'clock this morning, we had no knowledge of where our son was. That's Their wild. son Ty Henderson missing for almost 12 hours until my phone rang and I answered my phone and it was the trauma nurse. Um, she said, this is Christine calling from UMC Pediatrics Trauma Unit, Intensive Care Unit. She said, um, I just want to let you know that we have your son. Okay, I, I want to pause it for a second. To go so long and not know where your kid is after practice, like the amount of emotions that's going through your head, the I don't even think I'd be able to sleep. I don't, I don't know how, like that would have been the worst 12 hours of my life right there. Ty here. And I said, what? Ty was in a car crash in an Uber on his way home from basketball practice. And his parents say police told them the driver was allegedly driving under the influence. He let it be known quick as day that it was the Uber driver's fault. A hundred percent. And I'll say, what made you say a hundred percent? He said, because the Uber driver got took to jail for a DUI. Once a promising basketball That's star, terrible. now on the road to recovery to save his life. He's in and out of consciousness. 
Um, he's not really responsive at all. Um, he has um, broken bones in his face, fractures in his face. Um, his temple bone is uh, fractured as well. His ribs are fractured. Um, so they said it's going to be a long road to recovery for him. Um, he won't be able to play sports. You can see the pain in the in the in the, in the dad. Like he's trying to hold it together, but he's pissed. He's he looks like he's pissed. He's sad. He's mad. He, like I can see all the emotions in his face anymore. The family says Uber hasn't contacted them about Ty's accident. And an Uber home almost cost my son his life. And it's just unacceptable. But Uber did respond to us saying our hearts go out to the writer's family as they, they won't talk to the the family, but they'll they'll reach out to the news to put out a statement. That's that's awful. That's fucking terrible. They recover. We take the safety of our Uber community very seriously and we are looking into this further and that Uber has a strict no alcohol drug policy. And if they receive reports on suspected impaired driving, the driver may be deactivated. There should be some type of random testing um, for drug and alcohol to where, you know, you're not in jeopardizing the people who are patronizing the company's life. He's wrong. And I put the company at fault yeah. for even having people like this driver. The family does have a GoFundMe to help with Ty's recovery. That information will be located on our website at news3lv.com. Let's see if we can find that. Uh, I want to see what amount it's at. GoFund. That's so not much of a change. 4499 I'm going to drop it in chat if you guys want to help out. Uh, that's up to you guys. You know, it's sad. It's pretty sad. Let me check my chat. I think something's going on. Oh, all right. So, yeah, you guys have it. Pretty sad. And uh, I, I hope he has a fast recovery. So, moving on. Armed right share suspect in custody after three hour standoff in front of Mount Washington Metro Station. News right now out of Mount Washington, LAPD officers responding to an incident there. This is right by the train tracks. The department says there is a situation they're handling of someone refusing to get out of an Uber. This is near the metro station, so for now there is no train service between Highland Park and Heritage Square Station near the Southwest Museum. Bus shuttles have been requested and taking a wider view of it now. You can see officers wow. out of their vehicles kind of uh, surrounding the car right there. A lot of officers, it looks like one one has something drawn. I can't tell exactly what's in his hand. Uh, they do seem pretty calm, but uh, we're just trying to kind of piece together what exactly is happening. But you can see it's right along the railroad tracks there. We'll keep following it and bring you updates as we get them. Okay. A man who was forced, a man who forced his way into a ride vehicle as it sat parked in the Mount Washington area Wednesday morning was taken into custody following a roughly three hour standoff with Los Angeles Police Department officers and SWAT. Go away. Around 7.45 a.m., a rideshare driver called 911 regarding an uncooperative passenger with a gun who refused to get out of the car in front of the Southwest Museum metro station. Is he really a passenger if he forced his way into the car? I don't they make it I don't want to make it seem like this is someone who ordered a ride, got in the car, and was uh just in the car. This looks like it was someone who just forced his way into the car not using the app. I could be wrong. It was later uncovered that the man who forced his way into the car without using a rideshare app and the driver said he was not a taxi. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I'm right. The driver said he asked the suspect passenger to get out of the car, saw what looked like a gun, and fled to call police. He just left his car. I'm thinking, what would I do? I'm going to keep thinking, and I'll let you know. This brought on a lengthy, nearly three-hour standoff, which affected Metro train service in the area as police surrounded the parked silver ride chair sedan at Museum Drive in Marion Way, with two SWAT vehicles also responding. So what's going through my head is the driver must have taken his keys with him. But the second the passenger got out the car, I don't understand why the uh, the guy with the gun, I'm not going to call him the passenger, the guy with the gun stayed in the car. Throughout the ordeal, Metro train service between Highland Park and Heritage Square was halted as the Southwest Museum station was closed with bus shuttles temporarily taking passengers. Around 10.45 a.m., the suspect was in police custody and the weapon was determined to be a replica gun. Homie tried to rob someone with a replica gun and then stayed in the car. A line update, that's from the uh, 
That's it. That's all we have. Come on. There's there's no more to this. No way. I need I need more information. It's that park, Mount Washington area. Mount Washington area. Right here, driver. Standoff. Update. The man who forced his way just read that. I need more information. Bro. Let's go to news. Tools. Recent. Sort by date. This is really all we're, all we're getting. I need to know what he was running from. Why? I, I, I need more information. There's no more. So I guess we'll have to follow up with this next week, but I need, I need more information. I don't understand why this, this article is lacking so much information, but we'll keep moving. So this one is about a mystery that surrounded a missing woman and Uber driver's suicide. This sounds like something out of a movie, something that can't be made up, but keep in mind that things that we see in the movies are usually inspired by real life circumstances. This was like November, well, November 28th. Mystery continues to surround the case of a missing Texas woman as police report that an Uber driver linked to her disappearance died by suicide last week. Hey, clearly guilty. Clearly guilty. Amanda Stevenson, 20, of Victoria, Texas, was last seen on November 19th near Salem Road and was eventually reported missing two days later. Victoria is a small city of around 65,000 located roughly 120 miles southeast of San Antonio and 125 miles southwest of Houston. Since then, friends, family, and community members have conducted search parties between Victoria and nearby Yoakum in areas where those close to her believe that she might have been. Victoria police investigators also determined that Stevenson was acquainted with a local man, 45-year-old Kevin Bennetson, who was known to give her rides and worked for the rideshare service Uber. Sounds like an off-platform ride. Believing that he could be connected with Stevenson's disappearance or at least have some insight into her activities leading up to it, police conducted an initial interview with Benison and on Wednesday pulled him over for a traffic stop to ask him more questions. Okay. Department of Public Safety Sergeant Ruben San Miguel confirmed on Monday that Benison fatally shot himself during the stop. Wow. Wow. And this is her. Two photos of missing Texas woman Amanda Stevenson, an Uber driver connected with her disappearance, died by suicide during a traffic stop. Police officials characterized Benetton's death as an isolated incident, according to News 4 San Antonio, and said that the investigation into Stevenson's disappearance remains ongoing. Okay, I get it. The Lavaca County Sheriff's Office on Monday confirmed that it is aiding with the investigation. So that seems, nope, there's more. Searches have been underway at various locations Benetton was known to frequent and properties listed in his name, including a residence in Yoakum that has been searched over by 20 officers with police dogs and drones. Benetton was married and officials said that his wife has been cooperating with authorities in their search. Police department in a 200 mile radius were informed about the case immediately after it was opened. Likewise, multiple additional locations have been searched by department members. The Victoria Police Department said in a statement provided by Newsweek to Newsweek. Behind the scenes, advanced technological efforts are being conducted. However, some software efforts are being thwarted by the lack of passwords and are taking one and are taking time to obtain information. Other agency technology is also being utilized. Benison also listed himself as the owner of the business, business Benison Organic Farms on LinkedIn starting in 2021. Investigators have determined that the address associated with it is also in his name. All right, so I'm pretty sure there's an update here to this. Amanda Stevenson update. I'm pretty sure I saw it. All right, so we'll just we'll just check out this video. Amanda Stevenson disappeared 10 days ago in Victoria, Texas. That is just southwest of Houston. No clues, no contact with her frantic family. She literally just seemed to vanish. Yesterday, police found a body in a creek, and Amanda's family has confirmed to News Nation that it was Amanda. 
who would have celebrated her 21st birthday just a few days ago. Understandably, the family is absolutely devastated. And making things worse is the agonizing search for answers. Who would have done this? Who would have killed Amanda? Right, Police had a fantastic lead. An Uber driver named Kevin Bennettson, a married father of two who was known to give Amanda rides. And the officers had been questioning Bennettson. They even pulled him over to ask him a few more questions. But during that traffic stop, all holy hell broke loose. Bennettson pulled out a handgun and then shot himself to death. That was last Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving. I want to get Caitlin Becker in here. She's the senior reporter with the Daily Mail. What do we know about Kevin Bennettson, this mystery person this who really we now sad. can no longer question? Not a whole lot is known about this investigation, Ashley, but we do know, like you said, father of two, married, around 45 years old, working as a rideshare driver. Prior to this, for many years, he worked as an elementary school teacher and a substitute teacher, um, sometimes pre-kindergarten, sometimes third grade, fourth grade. But as of, I believe, 2022, according to records, he was no longer working for the school district. Why that is, we don't know. But for the time being, he was working as a rideshare driver, which is the connection that police and Stevenson's family believes is how these two knew each other. He's been called a known associate, and I think that wording is very specific. It's not a friend. It's not an acquaintance. It's not a colleague. It's a known associate. So it's someone that clearly she had interactions with but maybe not on a really well, personal level okay i have some words to say one i'm gonna make clear i don't know the full story but it is bothersome to me that people like this serve in our community and can be a threat to the people of their community at any given time like this this guy was around kids don't know what he was doing there i'm not gonna make any assumptions but the assumptions i will make is it's very likely he had something to do with this, this woman. And even if that's not the case, it's very likely he's had something to do with other people, right? This might, this is just the one that we're aware of. We don't know what else he was doing for someone to get pulled over by the cops and then to immediately shoot themselves. It's, it's like, there's something that you are hiding and I obviously don't know what it is. It could be this, it could be more than this. And it's it's so bothersome to me that someone who can be like a teacher and have access to a bunch of kids and, and, and things like that is just like they exist. And it, it really makes me upset. I get how Uber works, but I could imagine that her cell phone would yield a lot of information. What, what has the cell phone told us? And actually, police imagine that the cell phone will do exactly that, but it is password protected and no one seems to know her password. So what they've been working on is trying to get into her cell phone to see who she was communicating with in those days and hours leading up to her disappearance. And her family believes that she and this rideshare driver were together around the time she did disappear. Chances so are, I know that her if, if he's a, a known acquaintance, chances are this this app, this ride wasn't even on the app. I, I, I doubt he would do something, if, if this is his first time, I doubt he would do something if it were a ride through the app. And if he was regularly picking her up in this small town, they probably worked out a deal to do something off the app. Like it's not uncommon for that to happen. Body's just been found. It's just been confirmed to us that, that it was her, she was in a creek. But do we know at this early stage if they found any evidence with the body that might've actually given us some clues or at least led to someone? It's too early for police to have revealed any of that, and autopsy is being done. But I do know that around the time that that traffic stop happened, when the rideshare driver took his own life, police had searched his home not long before that. So I don't know if there was any connection there. And of course, we know that he used a gun to take his own life. We don't know the cause or manner of death here for this poor young woman. But my mind immediately went to if there could potentially be a match with that gun. Well, it's awfully suspicious, the timing of him uh, taking his own life. So, Caitlin, yeah. when you find out more about this, particularly when they start yielding some information about what the body tells them, definitely um, report back to us. Let us know what happens. Thank definitely you. definitely going to keep up with this one. Um, but that's pretty much it for that topic. They don't have their comments turned on. I would have liked to read the comments here. There we go. Cheryl says, there's nothing that says he's a guilty man more than taking his own life. I feel sorry for his wife and children who played no part in this horrific situation, but will suffer the consequences just as much as they love what the loved ones of Amanda. My thoughts and prayers are with you. Truly heartbreaking. How are you supposed to feel safe in that kind of world? Like, this is kind of the emotions that are stirring up for me. I don't have any kids yet, but I want some. And I'm like, these events are starting to hit differently now that I'm even thinking about just having kids. You can do everything right and still end up getting killed. Man, that's, that's, that's real. <laughs> that's real. Such a tragedy for Amanda and her family. Detectives should start looking at other. Yeah, this, this is exactly what I was alluding to. Detectives should start. Let me uh, zoom in for you guys. Detectives should start looking at other dead females and see if there's a connection. I bet the rideshare driver thought he was caught and blew his brains out. Like that's what I'm going to follow up with this. There has to be more. There's probably other missing cases that he's probably responsible for. And 
it feels bad to make that kind of assumption so far out, but I think it's likely I could be wrong, right? I could be wrong, but I think that there's, there's a, a lot more to this that's going to come out over the next couple of weeks. All right, so let's move, over, move forward. That was a little, little too sad for me. So Houston expands free eco-friendly ride sharing program to more neighborhoods. I think this, uh, I'll give you my opinion after we read through it. Let me stop giving you my opinion before I tell you what it's about. <laughs> All right. Houston City Council, Council members approved Wednesday to expand an eco-friendly rideshare program to more neighborhoods in the city, a vote aimed at helping the most underserved and undersourced communities get transportation to critical services. The more than $281,000 in funds will be used to expand RIDE, a rideshare program that connects residents to grocery stores, medical care, pharmacies, doctor's offices, schools, bus stops, and other places. The city's partnership with RIDE started in June with the rideshare giving free transportation rides to residents in the third ward neighborhood. I will say, out of all the government programs I ever hear of, this number, $281,000, is, in my opinion, low. I think that that's well budgeted for a service of this magnitude. According to officials, the expansion was spurred after a successful pilot program has been wildly successful with an average of 3,000 passengers a month. That is a good amount of passengers, right? So if you're a rideshare driver, even, even though like this, this is a very positive plat uh, platform, right? If you're a rideshare driver, this will hurt your pockets. If, what is this, Houston, I believe it was? Oh, man. Let's see. Houston. Yeah, it's in Houston. So the two the two ride vehicles are expected to be available to pick up residents in the second war starting December 1st and grow to other neighborhoods in the coming months. Ride provides rides Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Residents can request a ride by downloading the Ride Circuit app. That's pretty good. Cool. So they have an app. You know, they are, it's a free. They're freely competing with Uber and Lyft drivers. However... From 4 a.m. to from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. I don't drive during those times. I don't drive during rush hour unless I'm trying to hit like some major goal. Uh, but there are people who can only drive from this time because you know that's when their kids are in school. So it's gonna be like it's gonna really hurt those those Uber and Lyft drivers. It's exciting to see a mayor and city council get behind a true eco-friendly initiative aimed at providing critical transportation needs for underserved communities. That's rare. I will say that is a rare win for those communities. That is, this is going to be a loss for Uber and Lyft drivers. Evolved Houston presidents and executive director Casey Brown said in a statement, the program has been an amazing success in the third ward. And now another historically underserved community will be able to benefit from a service that gets residents to and from in town destinations for free. Houston Mayor Sylvester Turner highlighted Wednesday that the service has been beneficial for seniors in the city. District D Councilor Carolyn Evans Shabazz said that in addition to seniors, the rideshare service has been a helpful resource for students at two of the city's higher education institutions. I know that one, I know the one that we have is not just for the seniors. It has been a tremendous help to the students at Texas Southern and the University of Houston as well. So that's the beauty of it is that it serves all of those communities. If you're trying to hit bonuses, like a ride bonus, and you live in Houston and you are used to being able to get quick rides through the students, this is going to make it hardest to get, right? And that, don't don't take that as me like hating on the program. This is me acknowledging like the cause and effects of the program existed. I think this is a great use of government money, right? But I think that it's gonna it's gonna have a negative impact on Uber and Lyft drivers in the city, right? Let's see. R-Y-D-E, Houston. Houston, right? Let's see, let's see what they say. Now, this is not it. Free ride share. Oh, I'm trying to get some, some more pictures of it. So I wonder how many, like they said they took, what, 3,000 rides? In the pilot program. Can't access this website. So no, I think it's a great program. Um, it's we're seeing a lot more of these kinds of programs pop up in the di different cities. Not all of them are free. Uh, not all of them are government based. Like there's the one in Tampa. 
Tampa Tesla ride share. It's called Dash. It launched in temp Tampa. It's like $2 for them. They're these yellow ones in the background. And it's going to have an impact on rideshare drivers' ability to make money. Like, we need to be aware of these things because they're becoming more widespread. And they're, they're in major, Tampa's a major city. Houston's a major city. And eventually, it will trickle down everywhere. So we have to keep that in mind as we pursue our rideshare endeavors. Like, I really don't believe rideshare is great for long term. I think it's a great stepping stone. But every single year, it gets harder and harder to make more money, right? We, we see old school drivers talk about this all the time. I've only been doing it for three years. And every time they, they see these prices, they're like, oh, you know, they used to make more money before. And we're seeing that there is a declining trend. So we need to have a plan to use Uber and Lyft as best as possible as a stepping stone into something else. So I'm, I'm always going to point these instances out to people. Um, a lot of people don't think like Uber and Lyft will go away eventually. And even if it doesn't go away completely, it's going to get harder. So always keep that in mind. All right, moving forward. So this is kind of the last thought process we're going to go through. Uh, Pittsburgh Uber drivers frustrated with app issues as Steeler game nears. So well, again, we'll just listen to the story before well, I give my advice. Their app is a Let's see if we can, there we go. Start this over. And as Steelers fans are planning to see Sunday's big game against the Cardinals, Uber drivers have a problem. Their app is experiencing technical issues, and now drivers are worried they may miss a big profit weekend. Alexander Todd talks with a concerned driver, and she's live now with the story. Yeah, Erica, Uber drivers are not happy with this pause in service and no communication back and forth with customer support. I did speak with an Uber driver and a Uber rider about things going on tonight. Jake Parison has been an Uber driver in Pittsburgh for a few years. Thursday afternoon, a system update came in on his phone for his Uber app. But look how old that phone is. This, what, what year is this article from? He has an iPhone 4? Wow. Since that update, the app only offers Parison the option to make deliveries, not drive X or XL cars like he usually does. He says the support team is looking into the issue and that they say it will be resolved in 72 hours. And I talked to support and they are saying that there's a glitch in the system that they can't fix it. I've had that glitch before. And they're trying to their best and give them a couple days. And in the meantime, me and my uh, fellow drivers are just losing money left and right. However, this will not be in time to benefit from the busy weekend due to the Steelers home game this weekend. With the Steeler game coming up tomorrow and everything, we're losing a ton of money. It's the one of the biggest days of the year besides New Year's Eve and Thanksgiving. And yeah, Friday. New Year's Eve is coming up. He says other drivers are experiencing the same issue, but now Uber riders are seeing a quadruple surge in pricing for rides as well. At the airport, they definitely were. They were. The yeah, they were airport. double, double yeah, for the airport. It was sixty-nine dollars. From so if you're out there in Pittsburgh right now and you're able to go online and pick up passengers, you need to take advantage of what's happening. It's unfortunate to the drivers who who can't. Uh, pick Uber X and they can only do deliveries. My prayers go out to you guys. But for those of you who are not suffering from this bug and you're close to the Pittsburgh area and you can drive there, you need to get your butt over there. I don't care if it's an hour away, two hours away, especially with, with football going on. I would jump on this opportunity to go and make some money. Before I had checked, it was like 35. Parison asked Uber customer service about any lost wages due to the system being down, and Uber says there is nothing that they can do. I'm just hoping and praying that they do something soon. We reached out to Uber for a comment and have not heard back. Here They're not going to hear anything back. So this is, this is actually not the story I thought it was. I, I was going to talk about how I have issues picking up passengers in congested areas because my cell service always like drops like it, I can never connect with Uber or Lyft. I tried switching from Mint Mobile to T-Mobile and now I've actually tried switching to AT&T. So I had to get a new phone this time. I didn't have to. I chose to. But uh, that's pretty much it. If you have not seen my video on exposing a, uh, a Lyft driver, this is us live right now. Uh, this one here, go watch it. It's a really good video. I put some time into it. 
uh, respond to the haters. And uh, it's just a good video. But it was fun hanging with you guys. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. We'll be here every Monday, 5 p.m. EST. And uh, stay safe. Maybe not Christmas. I don't know. But uh, go out there and make some money. Peace.